going after SKA and having to deal with sooner deadlines and sadly smaller amounts of data. Um, so I'm going to start by, by introducing LSST. Um, for anyone here who is not an astronomer or is an astronomer who's been living under a rock, um, I'll, I'll talk about where we're at with the LSST software stack, um, what it can do right now and why you might care. Um, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about what we've learned by building it the way we have. Um, in some respects, some of, this, some of these might be mistakes that we hopefully still have a chance to go back and resolve. Some of them may be mistakes we have to live with and some of the things, um, I hopefully all of them are things that everyone can learn from. Oh, good point. I should use a microphone. Is that better? All righty. Um, at the very end, I'm going to uh, talk briefly about um, one spin-off product, project that may be of a, a, a broader use, um, even outside of astronomy. So uh, LSST would have very impressive specs if we hadn't just heard about the SKA. Um, it's a, a optical telescope um, and associated survey um, that will um, uh, produce more data than any other optical survey we've We've, we've had so far. And that's about 15 terabytes a night um, and uh, several uh, petabytes by the, the end of the survey. Um, this is scheduled to start in seven to eight years and last for another 10 years after that. Um, but we're still, we're already well underway building it. Um, one big uh, aspect of this is not only is this a lot more data, we're also required to do a lot more with it. The end product of the LSST pipelines are the catalogs that come out. And we're, we need to do measurements at a level that increase the, our control of systematic errors um, to keep up with the decrease in, in statistical errors that will come from having a much larger survey. And so not only do we have to process more data, we have to process significantly better than we have done in the past. So what are we doing? Um, I'm just going to go through these flowcharts really quickly to give you an overall idea of what we're trying to accomplish. So every night, we need to take the uh, raw images, calibration images, calibrate them. We need to um, do difference imaging to look for transients and um, moving objects. We need to try to associate those moving objects and the transients with other things we've detected, try to find asteroids, and generate alerts. All this very quickly. Um, we're taking new images every 30 seconds, um, and we essentially need to get them out, uh, get the alerts out at the, at the same rate. Um, every year, we're going to rerun all of that nightly processing that we've done on all the data we've acquired um, since the beginning of the survey. We need to make those COAD images that we use to do the differencing. Um, we need to measure objects that are, are detected only at the full depth of all of the images that went into it. That's something like 200 images in every band that we're doing. Um, and then we need to go back and measure the properties of the, each of those objects on every single image. Um, and we need to populate some pretty huge databases afterwards. So we don't do all that yet, um, but we actually do most of almost all of it. Um, the hardest parts are still what remains, of course. Um, and here's how we've, the, the software we've been building to do it. Um, it's multi-packages, multi many Python packages together. Um, most of them are written mostly in C++ with wrappers using SWIG, um, and our high-level pipeline code is written, it's written in pure Python. Um, we, our build system uses SCONs, and for something, a reason I'll get into more later, um, most of the third-party packages we use right now are C and C++ packages, not Python ones, and that's, that's one of the trade-offs that comes with the design we've, we've, we've gone with so far. Um, one thing I'd like to emphasize, is this, this software is not specific to LSST. Um, we've, we've designed it with the intention that it should be usable for any optical near IR um, UV survey. And in fact, we're using it already for some, uh, for the HSC survey, um, which is a new camera going on the Subaru telescope in Hawaii, um, which has just uh, been commissioned recently. And so um, we're going to be using this for real data very, very soon. Um, and we've already used it in some level um, for a huge number of other telescopes. Um, so, what have we written? I'm not, looks like this is probably not terribly legible, um, at least from a distance. But all this stuff in orange is what we've written in, in C++, and the blue is what we've written in pure Python. Um, and the key here is we, we've chosen to write most of our primitives, all the, the 
useful little classes that are useful for astronomy in C++ and wrap them to make them available for Python. And this was because most of our, our most crucial algorithms are things that we felt that we'd probably need to write in C++. Part of this may have been due to the fact that many of the people who came onto the project earlier were more experienced C programmers than they were Python programmers. Um, but I think it's also true that we, we can't just look to simple vectorization of, of large array operations to do the kinds of things that we need to speed it up. Um, that said, it's very clear that a lot of the things we want to do are best done in Python and, and we really don't want to do them in C++. So, if you're considering using the LSST stack, um, everything I've said so far has mostly been favorable, but here's the real situation. Um, we have a whole lot of very useful astronomical primitives, at least for those of you in optical and your IR astron uh, astronomy. Um, the classes we have make it easier to, easy to write fairly complex bits of code in just a few lines um, of, of Python. Um, however, it's, the APIs are very unstable. Um, there's a lot of stuff that we've written that we're not terribly happy with and we plan to rewrite um, in the next few years. Um, and because it's written in C++ and we haven't put in a whole lot of attention into how that translates into Python, it's kind of ugly Python. It's all usable Python, but it's kind of ugly. Um, the good news is a lot of our algorithms are really our state of the art. We are trying to push the boundaries of doing the data analysis um, and in a lot of domains that are, are very difficult in the past have had really only um, private codes or codes that were nominally public but pretty much impossible to install, install in any system other than the one of the developer who wrote it. Um, but they're all very poorly documented right now. Um, and we have a small development team and we haven't been able to Eventually, we'll have funding, we hope, to, to improve this documentation because we do expect this software to be used by all users of LSST data, um, um, even though we'll be running it for the data releases. Um, it's not there yet. Um, everything is camera agnostic. Um, there's, a, there's a layer you have to write to make it work for a, a new system, but it provides a, a good deal um, of software that we hope will never have to be written again for this kind of um, optical um, uh, survey. So uh, the summary of this is that if you were writing a pipeline for a new optical telescope, new camera, we, this is something you should really dive into. Join the project, learn, dive into the code, help out with it, and you'll save a lot of time. If you're just a casual user, wait a couple of years, and then you'll want to use it. So I'm going to switch gears a little bit now and talk about lessons learned um, and what the trade-offs are from the way we decided to develop things. Um, certainly, I think I'm, if the last speaker expected to have to defend the use of Python against the C++ aficionados, I, I actually feel even more so in this crowd that I have to defend the use of C++ against the Python aficionados. Um, but I think we, we can uh, agree at least that, that something needs to make tight loops over pixels happen in some sort of compiled language. Um, maybe that's Python that gets compiled, but uh, you can't expect to do it with regular interpreted Python. Um, and the, I think we all agree that the, the high level stuff needs to happen in Python. Now what we've done is put the primitives in C++. Um, and there are some advantages to having put it in Python. I think you would, it's easier to write those primitives in Python. Um, and they end up being nicer to use from Python. And it makes your, the rest of your Python code probably prettier unless you do put a lot of effort into that mapping layer. Um, and a crucial one is you could use more third-party Python libraries. And, and I'm sure as we'll hear more in this session, there are a lot of, of nice pure Python or, or targeted towards Python astronomy libraries that are being developed. Um, the way we've gone does not allow us to use those. And so this slide is partially an apology and an explanation to those people working on uh, Python-targeted astronomy libraries, why LSST hasn't been using them. Um, and the reason is because we need to deal with our primitives, which are in C++, and so we need to be able to call things from both C++ and Python. And so from our perspective, for a library to be usable for our purposes, we really need a C API. Um, um, but the advantage of this is, even if you, you take a sensible approach and you prototype everything in Python, when it comes time to 
bump one of those algorithms that turns out to be time critical into, uh, into C++, you already have the primitives there waiting for you. If you start with all of your primitives in Python when you need to bump those things, then you, you can encounter a major refactoring, whereas most of these primitives are not that much harder to write in C++ with some wrapping because they're fairly simple things in and of themselves. Um, I'm not sure we made the right choice in the end. Um, I think there's some chance that we'll, we'll move things around a bit, but uh, I think to a large extent, we, we will stay a, a, a C++ shop um, or as a major component um, until LSST is on the sky. So what have we learned about actually doing this um, and the tools that are available? This slide is my slide that complains about, or the first of two slides complaining about the tools available to do that. Um, and if there's anyone in the audience who is writing these sort of tools, um, I'd certainly love to talk with you at some point. Um, one big caveat is I'm not an expert on Cython, which is certainly, I think, the hottest way to do this, to handle this problem. Um, and it wasn't something that was available or it wasn't mature enough to do this, this when we started. Um, so I won't be able to talk about that or, or contrast and compare it, but certainly I have, I have grown to deeply hate SWIG and yet at the same time I can't live without it. Um, it's great for simple C++ code and for isolated modules, but we have complicated C++ code and a lot of modules. And that mostly works, but when it doesn't work, it's really hell to debug. Um, and it's due to the fact that there are things in, in SWIG that seem to be declarative, but it turns out that it depends on where you put them uh, in the order and what order you import things in, and if you get it wrong, there's nothing you can do but permute, permute your, your code until it works. Um, it also, with the size of things we have, with the number of packages we have and the complexity of the C++, the, um, the size of the files can get into the hundreds of megabytes, and this is generated C files, um, and those are a pain to uh, compile. I'm personally a big boost Python fan um, from my pre-LSST days, but even I have to admit that um, it's not terribly alive. There's not a whole lot of active Boost Python development going on, and I think it's, uh, it's dying as a result of that, and it's maybe a bit too complex for anyone new to take over. Um, I'm honestly one of the candidates for doing that, and I have a day job already, thanks. Um, so I don't think either of those is really a great option. I'm hoping there's something better. Um, I have this idea of writing it myself someday, but that's never actually going to happen in reality um, because in the end I'd prefer to be an astronomer. Um, but if someone were to write such a thing, um, here are my guidelines. I'm, these are, I, I'm, I imagine will be somewhat controversial to anyone who knows deeply about these, um, but this is what I really think we need from the perspective of a C++ um, uh, fan um, and a bit of a curmudgeon. Um, I think you really do want to extract as much information as you can from the C++ headers. Um, you don't want to repeat that information. Um, you also should not try to parse it yourself, please. Anyone who tries to write a C++ parser these days is stepping down a bad, bad path because um, there are better options these days. Um, you do need to think about memory management because C++ and, and Python use m memory differently. Um, and I, I don't like the idea of giving Python users something that can seg fault if they do the wrong thing with it. Um, and I, I, I'm also skeptical of efforts to make the wrappers, make the wrapper generation specification so pretty before worrying about what the wrappers that look like, look like that come out of it. Finally, um, I wanted to just mention and advertise a project that I've written that's been used mainly by LSST so far, but may be of broader interest. Um, I'm not sure this is going to be the end solution to any of these problems, but right now, as far as I can tell, it's the easiest way to write NumPy or NumPy uh, using code in C++. It's a C++ multidimensional array library that has mappers built in for Boost Python and Swig. Um, and everything sort of, because it's a, a, uh, a C++, there's a, a dozen, C, or at least, C++ multidimensional array libraries, and many of them are focused on fast math. This one is focused on being as similar as possible to NumPy in terms of memory management and data layout, so that when you translate things, the translation really is very straightforward. Um, I think there are 
projects underway right now that we'll probably hear about tomorrow um, that will end up doing this better someday because they're led by people who are not astronomers in their day jobs. Um, but until those stabilize, this is actually a pretty good option. Um, and that's about all I have. Um, here's some contact information. If you are interested in using the LSST software stack, here are some links, um, and I'm happy to talk to you. All right. Uh, so the question is whether we've looked into GPU offloading for looping over pixels. Um, and we have. Um, it's not our baseline plan right now. Um, in fact, one of the reasons that LSST is sticking to things like um, C++ as well and SWIG, um, instead of more newer um, uh, Python-based projects, as well is the same reason that we're not jumping straight into GPUs. And that is because we're very concerned about what's going to be there in 10 years um, or eight years now. Um, and the, our presentations to funding uh, agencies and so on has to really be conservative at this point. Um, I think there's a good chance that we could, we could take a lot of advantage of GPUs because a lot of our things are data parallel at the pixel level, um, but we're not, we don't want to scope out our hardware plans um, expecting the, the GPU options to be the same as they are today. Right. Yes. I, I, I've certainly experienced the same thing, so that this is, uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I did. So I, I'm, I'm very interested in that. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, yeah, that's that's good to hear. I, I, I was at one point, uh, so the, the, the comment is that I, I might be interested in this, this cross -jess, um, uh option for, for code generation. Um, at one point, I, I kind of wrote off GCC XML because it also looked dead. And at one point, it was a way to, um, one part of a way to generate uh, wrappers using Boost Python. But it seems to have been revived since then, and, and it looks like it's worth another look. I'm hoping someone will do something better with Clang, since I think that's really the future for C++ parsing. Well, Cython could certainly be part of it, but I think you need a, you need a C++ plus part, sure, to, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. We I don't know that we've talked with that group in particular. Um, we've. We've certainly had some communication with the Dark Energy Survey team um, and the Euclid team. Um, I think we, we kind of both, all those projects got started up too early to have been combined. But it's a good sign at least that LSST and Subaru are now on the same page. And I'm hoping that we'll find ways to, to merge with what else, is, uh, what else is out there.